Call to order the uh, May 24th AMATS Policy Committee meeting. It's 1 o'clock. We have a quorum here. We have Cindy Heil, Mayor Sullivan, Rob Campbell are the three attendees. Both Assemblyman Flynn is here as we speak. <laughs> Mr. Birch is not in attendance at this point, but we'll note if he arrives later. Should we send out the marshals? The marshals. Okay, so Mr. Lyons, we have in front of us an agenda. Is this the true and accurate agenda to the best of your knowledge? This is it. Okay, committee members, do we have any move to approve the agenda? Second. Mr. Flynn, are you engaged? I am. Excellent. Do you have any comments or changes to the agenda? It's a lovely agenda. Thank you. Okay. Hearing no further objections, I'll assume the agenda will stand as written. Public involvement announcement. All the AMATs are public meetings. Uh, and the public is invited to testify. If we have a business item, we will have a presentation by staff or the committee. And then the committee will have an opportunity to comment and discuss. At that point, we will then let the public have an opportunity to comment on it. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any minutes to approve today? Uh, we don't have any minutes today. I do have the, uh, the May 3rd, which was where we discussed the MTP. Those are about 34 pages long, so I'm just getting through them. There are obviously, as you know, a lot of motions and amendments in that, and so I don't think I'll be able to truncate them too much, okay. but uh, I just started from uh, I think those are important minutes. They're so very important. That's so our most important document. Quality on those will be more important than haste. Yes. Okay. So we'll have those next month then? Yes. Thank you. Business items. The first thing on our thing is the freight advisory committee appointments, which I assume we have a. You have item 5A before you, a two pager. It includes uh, two resumes and the memo. The, uh, the two openings on the freight advisory committee. And so the technical advisory committee met and recommended approval of the two uh, resumes that are here. Terry Linsett from the Anchorage International Airport, and Doug Thompson with uh, Holland America. So that would fill the airport slot and uh, kind of a public member slot. In the past, the public member slot had been filled with a gentleman from Fred Myers, uh, regional manager from Fred Myers. I believe Mr. Flynn, and I know that uh, Ms. Selkraig at one point when she was on the committee had suggested that uh, we might want to look at putting someone on the committee who was related to the buses and such because they have difficulty getting through Anchorage, and so we took that suggestion, and uh, this gentleman has agreed to serve, which is a big part of the big part of the process. So, so by implication, we're now classifying people as freight. Yes, yes, your cargo. We called them freight that talks, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> in the rail business. So the technical advisory committee met and recommended approval of both of those folks. Okay. Motion. Yeah, we'll take a motion first. Then we'll discuss it. <laughs> Move to approve. Second. Move to approve and seconded. Any public comments on the motion before us to accept these two nominees for the Freight Advisory Committee? No public comments. Any committee comments? Well, I'll just try to work on. I'm just going to end up with Doug. I might not have made the suggestion. But, uh, no, okay. He's a good guy. It'll be great. <laughs> okay. Any objection to this? Passing unanimously. No objection, so those two people are hereby appointed to the Freight Advisory Committee. Next thing we have on our agenda is Port Resolution, which is 5B. Yes, sir. Do we have any discussion we'd like to have Let's on that? Let's make some quick comments on this. Okay. The uh, Technical Advisory Committee took this up at their last meeting, and during the discussion, we had a presentation by uh, Mr. Rudolph from uh, DOT, mm -hmm. and after that presentation, the Technical Advisory Committee, uh, their recommendation was for the Policy Committee to be shown that same presentation, and then after that to issue direction on what exactly uh, they want the Technical Committee and the staff to do. So. So do we have at least one presentation? Do we have any other? I've heard rumors of another presentation that we're going to have today. I've heard rumors of another presentation as well. I believe uh, we have someone Ooh. here, Mr. Governor Sheffield, to... Is he going to speak or does he actually have a presentation? I'm not certain. Uh, I'd like to speak. 
Okay. So, all right. So let's do our presentation then first, and we'll take a conversation and discussions on that. Certainly. Sure. Uh, my name is Bart Rudolph with the Department of Transportation, um, Anchorage Transportation Planner. Um, what I've put together here is just an overview of what happened during Safety Lou, how the earmarks were distributed, and what happened with continuing resolution, just to show how the state had that money, put it back in the formula funds, and um, how it ultimately affects AMATS um, in the big picture. So. I'm going to present this as a five-year plan. Safety Lou was 2005 to 2009, so the numbers are for five years, and then continuing resolution for ease of understanding what is really a complicated process. We did continue it as if it was another five years, operating under the same rules of continuing resolution, which were a little different with Safety Lou. So, I'm going to. There's a lot of math in here. Um, the numbers are approximate, so don't don't hold me to them exactly, but they're pretty close. Under Safety Lou, there were essentially two pots of money that came to the state of Alaska. There were formula funds, 2.1 billion over five years, and an additive earmarks, which was on top of those funds, all named to um, specific projects or entities, and that was about $400 million over five years. So $2.5 billion to Alaska, about $500 million a year. That's before any kind of off limits were, were taken out. Um, the funds. Within those formula funds, there were deductive earmarks, um, about $600 million over five years. Port of Anchorage had $25 million of those deductive earmarks. They also had a $7 million earmark in the added earmarks, and they had an FTA earmark for $25 million, so about $57 million over five years um, in earmarks during Safety Lou. We're not going to talk about that FTA earmark because that's not part of the highway program. That, that went away. Um, we'll continue to talk about these other earmarks. During this scenario, or during Safety Lou with the earmarks, um, about $1.7 billion over five years came to the state of Alaska. That's $2.1 billion minus any recessions or ob limits. So every year the uh, legislature takes out money. Um, for Oblin, it's, it helps balance the budget, so we never get exactly what Safety Lou says. So we got about $1.75 billion over those five years. You have to take out the $600 million in those deductive earmarks from those formula funds, so we got about 1.2. So over five years, that's about $240 million that came to the state of Alaska. Then it goes into different pots of money. Um, it gets separated out. 41% of those gets into what we call CTP and track pots. That's community transportation program and track, uh, mainly what we call transportation enhancements here. So that's $98.4 million gets divided into those, those pots of money. AMATS, well, how we get our allocation here at AMATS is we get 24% of those funds. So during Safety Lou, we were getting about $23.6 million a year. Sometimes it was a little more, sometimes it was a little less, but it was around $23.6 million a year. So then continuing resolution happened. Um, and those, some of those additive earmarks got added back into the formula funds, about a fourth of them. So for the purposes of this presentation, like I mentioned, we're going to continue this as if it was an additional five-year program. So we'll say $100 million of additive earmarks went into this new five-year program. That $7 million earmark was part of that. And so now we've got about $2.2 billion in formula funds with those earmarks in there. All the other additive earmarks, the three-fourths of them, the other $300 million went away. Those, those are gone. That money went nowhere. So now we're getting about $370 million a year, and I'll show you how I got that number in a second. 
those added earmarks that we got were added into the formula funds, and all those deductive earmarks were added to the formula funds. All the project names were stripped, and they just became funds in the formula funds. So now we have $2.2 billion in formula funds that came to the state of Alaska. So we do the math again. We were at $1.75 billion, and then we had to subtract that $600 million. But now we're just adding that extra $100 million, so we have about $1.85 billion um, in a new five-year program, essentially. Um, that, that we're dealing with now because we don't subtract any earmarks whatsoever in formula funds. So over five years, it's about $370 million is what we're getting now. 41% of that is $152 million, and AMATS gets 24% of that. So in the last couple of years, you've seen through the tip, we're now getting $36 million a year because of all those earmarks were added back into the formula funds. Um, so that's essentially the end of my presentation, just to, to show you how the AMAC formula funds and were, were affected with all those earmarks being added back in there, what actually happened with that earmark money. So if you have any questions, I'd be pleased to answer them. I'm sure there will be some questions on that part. But let's start with that. Does anybody from the audience have any questions before we get into the committee here? No? Committee members, do you have any questions for Mr. Rudolph on his presentation here? Well, it, Sure. So essentially, you've, you've just blended all the money into one pot, and based on the uh, the allocation, uh, obviously, AMATS has gotten an increase. Um, I guess that would suggest that uh, it's up to us at the policy committee if we want to direct those funds as an earmark. Uh, uh, that's our job to do then. Right through through the tip process would be correct. Yeah. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I just want to apologize for being late. I did uh, I did find a parking place uh, just uh, up the road here. So, um, I, so are are the are the earmarks and uh, earmarks that are identified? Are any of those uh, uh, are, are we do we have those in the in the budget? In any? Well, I, again, I'll try to paraphrase, but I think what Mr. Rudolph is saying that under the continuing resolution, those earmarks have disappeared as earmarks. The money has flown into the the bigger pot. But they, none of those retained their individual names once we went into continuing resolution. What were the names that were next to those? those well, I think the well, Port Anchorage was one of the ones that was in one of the we talking about. But yeah. there were, uh, I think, some $400 million worth of projects right. that had uh, earmarked names associated with them. But clearly, what we had already planned for with, with uh, earmarks that were uh, previously <laughs> dedicated to the port, that has to go through this, uh, this process here. Then. That's currently the way okay. it's set up, yes. Thank you. I guess, Mr. Chairman, sure. what? my understanding of this resolution, which is the for purpose of the reason we're getting this presentation, was that uh, that DOT had received money in that little circle that's now crossed out for the Port of Anchorage under safety lube, but never released it to us, correct? The, the, the money went to the port during 2005 and 2009. That money went to the port after continuing resolution, some of those added earmarks were added to the formula funds, and those were not distributed to the port as they once were. They were put into the state of Alaska formula funds. All the earmarks that were in there were, were stripped of all their titles. So we got a portion of it based on the new distribution of funds, but we didn't get the whole amount. Basically. Right. Well, well, the port got nothing. The port got nothing, I got that part. But AMATS got, AMATS got, got part it. of the pool. Yeah. yeah, I think that's the... the the wordsmithing here is that the money went into the pot. The pot was redivided based on the, on the allocation numbers. AMATS got an in increase of $12 million a year mm -hmm. against whatever the port lost in their specific thing. And those two are different things. But there is no uh, Swiss bank account with Port of Anchorage uh, on it with a secret stash of money anywhere. It all went into this big blue yeah. initial pot, if you will, and it's been redivided since then. Okay, that's different than I have, how I understood it before, so I think you will. I think that's why we've had Mr. Rudolph yeah. put this together for us, is I think it, in its own way, it simplifies what we're talking about here. And this resolution that would set that, set that uh, back to, to where it, uh, it was no, before. Uh, Not I, think, exactly. I think that's what we're going to be discussing here in some detail, and I, I don't know exactly what the, I understand, I think, what the intent of this resolution was, but I, we need to speak to the author about that. I mean, we're, right now, when we understand what Mr. Rudolph has said, we're going to get into that. Ms. Heil? Um, and it's my understanding that every year, the money's completely spent 
and then you get a new res a continuing resolution, you get a new pot of money, and that every year is completely spent, and nothing carries over from year to year. That's correct. Okay. It's an important point. Thank you. Okay. So would you like to introduce this as a motion? Would you like to reconsider this? Would you like no, to I'd like to hear from Governor Sheffield. Okay, that's for the discussion off in the crowd. Okay. Sure. Please. Mr. Sheffield, why don't you give us your testimony? I mean sit over here, I guess. Yeah. Sure. You can even turn on the lights if you want to. <laughs> turn off the lights so we don't know what we're doing here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Well, I guess I spent four years on this problem, and uh, people in Washington, D.C., and all of us at the court. <clears throat> Basically, uh, Mr. Mayor, here's, here's what the gentleman over here said, and this, this is kind of a point-by-point you know, point, uh, uh, yeah, we're talking about uh, we're talking about money above the line and, above, above, and money above sort of the line, I guess you might say. And, and so a certain portion of it was below the line, meaning that, meaning that uh, those funds uh, would be uh, going to, those funds would be going to DOT as part of their, part of their uh, distribution. And funds above the line were extra funds that were granted to the court. And then after after the uh, bill ran out and was extended, then those monies that the court were getting all went to uh, um, to uh, to the, to the state of Alaska. And the governor said that he would save that money until we got this resolved and, and, and not spend it. And so uh, we've been three or four years on this problem of getting our $6.4 million a year, which is like $18, $20 million now. And uh, federal Highways, FHWA, say that that even though uh, the money was transferred to the state, if the DOT were to allow it to be used for the court, it would have to comply with Title, I think, 23. And we think we do. And we've had testimony before AMATS before on that issue. Um, I think Emily Cotter might be on the phone and could maybe explain this more if you needed me. But anyway, so it, it's a it's really a matter of fairness. Does you know DOT uh, takes all the money and and which was allocated to the court and. And it's part of the transportation system of Alaska. It's not a highway, but the whole port's a highway down there with trucks running everywhere. So we think that we, we comply with Title 23. And so it would be legal for the governor to give us those funds. And, and uh, our opposition is really uh, DOT. So, uh, there's a, there's a fairness uh, application here that needs to be applied, and uh, I, I think, you know, the court's important enough, serves 85% of the state of Alaska, and uh, not that highways aren't important too, but, but uh, the court is part of that delivery system, and so, and so we got to be fair to everybody to, to improve it. And uh, I think that uh, hopefully the policy committee will take a look at this and, and get even more information. I've got the, there's all the backup on it here. It's a good quarter of an inch thick, but it backs up what's on this page that you have there, Mr. Thank you. Do we have a motion to approve this? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
do we have any public, uh, I know this is kind of a public testimony thing, but I think I'll go ahead and allow some discussion with this testifier if nobody objects as opposed to just treating it as a testimony. Um, does the public have any questions or comments for Governor Sheffield? Okay, I'm, I suspect the committee members will then. Um, anybody in particular, Mr. Sullivan, would you have any clarifications you'd like from the governor on this testimony? Well, uh, just if we don't mind a little the latitude here, uh, with our, our Mr. Rudolph from DOT, you, you made the statement that uh, virtually all the money, um, including money that was formerly the earmark, has been now blended into the the big pool, and so there really is no other separate monies that DOT has set aside uh, and using for any other purpose uh, that was formerly earmarked. That's correct. Yeah, and so I think it, it, I think it becomes fairly clear um, what our path forward would be if the policy committee was willing to do so, and I don't think we can do it at this meeting because I don't think it's on the agenda. But if we feel that out of the allocation that we've received, that some of those money should be going to the port. It sounds like it's our job to um, make that call, and as you said in the tip, I believe, and, uh, when would be our opportunity to do? Is that considered a major amendment to the? To the uh, uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. That since that's a new project, um, in terms of our financially constrained tables, it should be table three, four, or five. Since it's a new project for those tables, it would have to be a major amendment. Yes. And why don't you just give us a little primer on? timing of doing that I mean um, well a, we started the process today <clears throat> you, you drafted the appropriate amendment for the administration to bring forward to the body uh, a major amendment uh, gets released for 30 days of public review it goes to the Planning and Zoning Commission that would go through the assembly and then it would come back to this body for final approval and uh, typically five to six months if you're really lucky yeah <laughs> just knowing the the schedule of planning and zoning and the assembly and now it's the summer and all that sort of stuff so that's kind of the time frame we're looking at and I'm assuming this is something then that uh, again assuming the committee was uh, inclined to do so it would be have to be done annually uh, within the process or can you table it so that it's a you know there's a big dollar amount in the out years and it's a, a it's a portion well, and the you know the tip right now we will have projects in there that show several years right. worth of funding and we get those uh, we get legislative authority from the Alaska legislature to spend those funds every year I mean, you folks obligate a, a four-year tip but the, those individual funds have to get obligated each year by the Alaska legislature so you could put in there a port project in table three and show four years of funding the Alaska legislature would still have to obligate it and you know, the, the money would have to sure. be there. So okay. you, you, you wouldn't have to do it every single year. Just do it once. Mr. Mayor, am I hearing you correctly? Your, your thinking is should, to contemplate adding the port project to the MTP so that we can take monies that we've kind of planned for our road yeah. projects and divert some of them to the port. Yeah. And, and, and the rationale behind that being, as Mr. Rudolph pointed out, we've received, you know, about $12 million more because of the blending of the earmarks. Um, so, uh, quite frankly, we're uh, flush with extra road project money that we would not have had had they not blended the earmark money. And clearly some of that was designated for the most important transportation project in the state, which is the port. So I think it would certainly be appropriate to do a little reallocation. But we don't need to have that debate right. today because they, I'd have to bring something formal forward. Yeah. Yeah, I want to bit today. I have to think about that real hard. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, Mr. Birch. Well, I, as it was indicated at the out, outset, the, the governor was supportive of uh, preserving these these uh, dollars that were initially intended toward the port. Is that is that still the governor's intent? Well, the well I, I guess I, I can't speak for the governor. I mean, yeah. I, and I can't speak for any conversations that the right. two governors have had regarding this money. As a policy issue. I right? can only yeah. say that I have not received any communications from the governor on any level <clears throat> indicating to me as either the regional director of DOT or as the AMAT's chairman that there's some commitment for this money. That, that's that's my extent of my knowledge. I certainly am not saying anybody else doesn't have conversations they've yeah. had. But okay. uh, I think at this point it's clearly 
I think the mayor has gotten to where we all need to get to, and that is that we have received an extra $12 million a year, and it's our duty as the policy committee to figure out where the important places to spend that money is. I, I, I personally don't believe we're going to get a standalone edict from the governor or, or from anybody else telling us that we have to or we should spend money on the port. I think we've been passed the money, and it's our responsibility to determine how to allocate that money. If it goes through the process that Mr. Lyon just described, I think that the port would compete in some ways with other road projects in the system. I think Mr. Flood has alluded to that, and I think it would be a discussion of priorities as to you know, which projects do we think as an overall transportation system merit funding and how much thereof. Uh, it's a complicated thing, and I'm sure that we would rely heavily on the technical advisory committee to try to help us understand some of the trade-offs and some of the values that would go into those decisions about how to make those decisions. It probably also needs a more formal discussion of whether uh, this does, in fact, fit under Title 23. Well, I, I don't want to get into the federal regulations, but I would say there are, certainly are, and there's been a lot of legal research done on this, and I, I'm not privy to all of it, of course, and I, I'm not a lawyer either, but I believe that the general answer is yes, it does fit in some ways under Title 23, but as such, it would be under Title 23 requirements also, and it would be necessarily be MARID requirements such that those may be, it would be FHWA requirements such that those are. And it's a different type of thing and I think it would be, there would be some trade-offs for that as well. So you're saying, if I can paraphrase, it would affect kinds of port projects that we could use those I would for. say that's a fair assessment. I, again, I don't know exactly yeah. that every project would qualify, but I certainly know that in general some of the projects would qualify, certainly the land-based projects right. that are supporting the infrastructure at the port face, I think would qualify. I'm not sure about the port face itself. But again, I'm sure we could have a lot of people give us their opinions on it if we wanted that. Setting us up for a long trek here, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> 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 if I could add, uh, I think I relate to the body either last meeting or one of the previous meetings that uh, in a meeting with Commissioner Luca and myself uh, uh, and, and Municipal manager, and I believe Governor Sheffield was there. He did indicate um, that this was the process to go through to allocate the money, and he was uh, supportive of that. So, um, right. heard it from the commissioner's mouth. So, I that was got, that's what got me down this path in the first place was a uh, senior <laughs> official with the administration said, this is, yep. this is what you need to do. I concur. So, so with, 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 uh, with that, I am going to suggest that uh, business item B has reached its somewhat anticlimactic conclusion, <laughs> unless there's some particular action somebody would like to suggest at this point. I'm going to say that I think we have a general feeling of where we're going to go with this. And, and we'll the table this. Okay. Does anybody object to tabling this for future discussion in perhaps a slightly modified form? <laughs> we'll, we'll let it come forward again under a different form then, let's put it that way. So, so tabled. Uh, thank you for your testifying, uh, Governor. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so we are now on to business item C, which is called Standardized <coughs> Socioeconomic Assumptions. And this, I believe, would be 5C on our table. Yes. And so do we have somebody that's going to... I'll give a, a start to this, and uh, I know there's several members of the TAC here that might be able to offer insight a little bit, but basically the idea was uh, in our discussions on the, on the MTP, we were trying to, uh, you know, get, get all of the projects in there and figure out, you know, how our model works and all that sort of stuff. We basically had... Most of the projects in our MTP, which when we did the modeling, we used the information from our TransCAD model, which is using the information from ICER, Institute of Social and Economic Research. Then we also had to plug in the information from the, the Kinnick Arm project. And they don't use ICER, they used some other information. And uh, the idea was uh, going forward, the, the idea behind this resolution is kind of going forward, it'd be nice if we were all on the same page with how we got our information and uh, what kind of information we're utilizing to inform our model. Uh, FHWA and FTA have suggested to us you know, we need to start thinking more regionally and take into account the population and uh, job, uh, you know, the, the 
job uh, situation out in the valley as well. And so we talked about you know, what kind of things can we do regionally because things are just starting to grow more. So the TAC met, discussed this resolution, modified it somewhat, we had a work session on it, and have brought it back uh, today before you. And it basically is, if you look at that very first uh, resolve, it directs, it's asking you to direct the, the TAC to come up with some protocols for developing some standard language uh, forecasts, etc., to help us inform the next version of the MTP when we do it. So that we're we're doing modeling on the same page, using you know same kind of information. So that's probably a really a roundabout way of saying it. But I don't know if Mr. Morris has anything to add to it. He kind of was the the father of this creature to bring it about. And you know we have a couple other TAC members that are here that might want to add to it. If if you have questions. Yeah. Okay. This is um, an easy topic. It's really yeah. I, kind of right. Can't see any possible way this could go sideways. <laughs> um, all right, I guess uh, Mr. Morris, do you want to give us any further insight into this, or are you standing by Mr. Lyons' discussion as it's been? I thought presented? he did a fine job. Okay. Uh, that, the only thing I would add is that I think we spent quite a bit of time. Um, this was a problem during the last MTP process for the TAC. Right. We had lots of trouble, I guess, reconciling some of the forecasts that were provided by Kabata with. Uh, uh, assumptions that were used within AMATS, and, and, and we saw this, I don't think I'm the only one, saw this as a way to streamline the process, make it improve the process. I mean, I think the TAC in particular should be looking at all the assumptions that go into the transportation model because they inform our decisions. And it's not just saying we're not just looking at Kabata, we're looking at our own modeling process, and, and we should have a process of sort of validating the assumptions that go into the model, where people are living, where people are working, because that's what drives the model. And so this is more, I think what Craig has alluded to is that we should have a pol some policies and procedures that uh, provide a procedure for doing that. And I think that's what we're suggesting here. Okay, and I'm going to make... If, I'm sorry, yeah, just to, and, and, and recognizing also that we're looking more and more at a region-wide uh, model and, and what's going on in that too is important, even more important than it used to be for uh, transportation right. infrastructure in Anchorage. Okay. I guess I'll, I'll make a couple statements, and I, I don't know how much the committee wants to discuss this or, or the public, either one, but let me say that there's a couple things that um, I'm concerned about as the chair when I get something like this, and let me just illuminate it briefly. Uh, number one, it appears that this is assigning a bunch of work to somebody, and I don't know who that would be. I'm pretty sure I don't have time for it. I don't think, you know, I, I don't know who that person would be. But I guess I'd like uh, a little more understanding personally or perhaps collectively about how that would be administered. And, and maybe that's, you know, I don't want to be in a do loop here of continually asking for information, you know, but to me it is relevant as to when I see that these things are going to be established, adopted, housed, somebody's going to be the keeper of this information, there's going to be a formal process. I guess I'd like an understanding of how much work we think that's going to be before we layer on another bunch of administrative requirements here for miscellaneous people. And the second thing is, I haven't reread this, I had an older draft that I was looking at earlier this week, but I'm concerned about jurisdictional issues. And, um, you know, there are certain agencies and other people that are within this body's jurisdiction, and I'm always a little bit concerned um, if we start requiring things of people that aren't under our jurisdiction. and that just philosophically is something I'm a little concerned about. So with with those two things in mind, do you have, uh, I'm not sure who the spokesman here, Mr. Morris, Mr. Lyon, do you have uh, general comments on those two issues or would you like me to just move to have other people communicate their concerns at this point? Well, I think for the most part what it's asking is to, it's saying, it's directing the TAC to draft some policies and procedures, which therefore would be the staff to just draft up some policies and procedures so that we're on the same page we're going forward. Um, it also says uh, require that all regionally significant projects be modeled using standardized household and employment forecasts. So I guess that would make it incumbent upon regionally significant projects to, to look at what we have out there and say, please use this. I mean, the reality is, can we, can we require a regionally significant project to do that? No. 
mentioned it maybe maybe we should say, suggest different. suggest that all regionally significant projects well i think that, that our uh, i don't want to use a big here but i'll say that i think that our our involvement in this is somebody wants to bring something forward for inclusion in our mtp or in, within our tip i think it's certainly within our purview then to say you have to follow these procedures to do that I think that is our role, to say if you want to bring something forward for inclusion in these documents, you have to play by these rules, it makes sense to do that. But just to say that all regionally significant projects have to follow this, I, I think number four, just looking at it, I mean, you know, to me it's, it's kind of covered under number two. You're saying anybody that wants to put transportation stuff into this thing has to use these forecasts, I think that makes sense to me. And number four looks redundant and somewhat confusing in its, its intent. Um, Okay, so let me let me pass it on. I'm sure that people have thoughts here too, Mr. Burge, Mr. Flynn. I'm sure. Well, I, I think you know, I'm I'm reminded of our our work on Title 21 and land use and land use development and how you know population and population density has such a dramatic impact over a long period of time, uh, particularly representing as as I do in, in South Anchorage uh, uh, some of the more uh, expansive areas of undeveloped real estate that the municipality has. So I, you know, I mean, I, I mean, on the face of it, it doesn't seem like an unreasonable approach. But I mean, at the same time, I know from a, a planning process, there's a, uh, you know, I mean, you, you, you do assess the, you know, what, you know, what are your anticipated, what's the population growth that and typically it ties to vacant land. So I, I, I guess I, you know, I, I, I understand your concern <clears throat> as far as, you know, who's actually going to be doing the work. Uh, but I mean, I don't know that it's uh, particularly harmful. Okay. Thank you. Actually, it's a good idea, Mr. Chairman, uh, because you know if we're going to have projects competing for dollars, they should all be competing on the same basis, and and uh, absolutely reasonable for us to say if you want to play our sandbox, you got to play by our rules. Right. Um, I think. I think. I'm well, sorry, we didn't do it before. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Do you have any? Well, I mean, I, I guess I generally agree that having uh, one standard is, is always a good thing when you're trying to do planning. Uh, otherwise, uh, confusion can reign, and it has it in past instances. So uh, I think the intent is good. Uh, I think it would be up to the staff and the TAC to uh, figure out just what is the best standard to use. And there's obviously a couple choices out there. And so we'll wait for a recommendation to see just what that, uh, what that means. But uh, I'll be supporting the resolution. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm supportive of this, and uh, I think it puts more of a formalization of what we did for the MTP because the policy committee, before that um, MTP effort started, passed a resolution that identified the, you know, the the rules that you know, they established which model they were going to use, and there were certain projects that were going to stay in regardless. There were ground rules, and I think this helps expand that a little bit and set some additional ground rules or, or ground rules for consideration before we go into this next MTP update mm -hmm. within the next four years. I think that's a good idea, especially since we have a lot of knowledge and we have a, a lot of lessons learned <coughs> and now's the time to go and make sure we don't have to relearn them if we wait too long in, um, in developing something like this. And it's going to come back before the policy committee. This right. doesn't commit you or commit the policy committee to anything at this point. It just says right. go forth and look out to it, see what you come up with, and bring it back. And so I think there's always an opportunity to, you know, tweak it or naysay it or change minds. So I think mm -hmm. it's fine for right now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I guess I, I think in general I agree with everybody that said the thing, you know, same general things. This is a good idea and concept, uh, and I think that we should remand this. I'm not sure that. I guess we'll get to a motion here in a minute, but I guess I'd like to su suggest that our motion be somewhat uh, a little bit broader than this recommendation <coughs> specificity uh, that we we have a motion that requires uh, a little more development of this process and bring it back before us again in the future for further um, clarification and discussion of some of the things we've talked about here. But I think I also uh, support the, the overall concept. I think it's a good one. And I think it ultimately, it, it, if it's done correctly and efficiently, it could save time in the overall system in the future. Um, and I guess I'll leave it at that. We still don't have any motion before us. Is that correct? Did we take public testimony on this, or were we so excited that we just jumped into it before we got to the public? I know we had Mr. Morris speak to us, but does anybody else from the public have any further comments they'd like to make on this? 
No. I guess at this point, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, John McPherson. Thank you. I, I might just point out there is there is a relationship between uh, land use and transportation. And so if, you, if you're if you considering a regionally significant transportation project, it's very likely that it's going to affect uh, the location of future development. So if you lock someone in to say we're going to use certain projections, yet if we're even considering something like an interchange, suddenly uh, business and growth is going to change to to flock to those TAZs. So almost inevitably, you're going to be modifying um, land use and distribution of population and employment every time you are considering a major transportation uh, change to the system. So I just point that out. So if I may, um, so then in general, are you saying you support this concept or are you saying land use drives transportation? I'm not sure. I'm just saying if you, uh, you, you can't necessarily have a static set distribution of population and employment and say all transportation projects shall use that because they actually affect that distribution. So you, you, you would have errors in your, in your travel forecasting if you were to force a major project to use a set distribution. I think I hear what you're saying. And I assume that you'll be taking this testimony to the TAC where they can implement it into their <laughs> recommendations. <laughs> well stated, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> All right. Anybody else care to talk on this topic? No? Could I have a motion then about this? Move to approve. Second. So clarity, additional clarification that motion, Mr. Chairman, as you spoke to before. I guess I'd like to, what I think we really need is a motion that directs the TAC to do something for us. This is a, a resolution presented by the TAC. It's not really instructions to them, per se. So could we have some clarification, Mr. Flynn or Mr. Sullivan, as you see appropriate? <coughs> you made the motion, but I can happily try and receive sure. And the motion just puts it on the table, and now it can be amended. Okay, well then okay. I'll move to amend the motion that we remand this subject to the TAC to develop the policies and procedures that will govern uh, uh, forecasting in future land development. Thank you. That's Thank close you. enough. Second. You want me to say that again, don't you? No, actually, <laughs> I just wanted a slight clarification. So you're taking the resolution off the table and replacing it with the direction, the amendment? Correct. Okay, I'll be clear on the record. Thank you. Should have the same effect, just a little more detail. Okay. All right. So we've got a motion before us. Does anybody have any further discussion they'd like to make on that motion, Mr. Birch, Mr. Flynn, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Donald? Is there anybody opposed to the motion before us? Okay. Passes unanimously. Thank you. We now have, I believe, Mr. Lyons, some informational reports, and I apologize for those that were bumped from last month to this month, but I appreciate their uh, willingness to come before us again. So who will be? Uh, I believe we have our non-motorized transportation status. Okay. From Lori Stanky. Thank you. I'm Thank you. Uh, well, I wanted to tell you about the non-motorized transportation plan. Uh, as you know, we have the pedestrian plan done and the bicycle plan done, and we're now working on the update to the area wide trails plan, which we're calling the Anchorage Trails Plan, just to make it a little easier to understand that it's a, a, an update but a new plan. Uh, so far, we had a number of meetings. First, we met with all the user groups individually, uh, you know, like the mushers one night, the, the ski drawers another night, and it was really helpful because we they were able to come in and and talk and not worry that somebody was saying something about, you know, they shouldn't be there. Uh, for instance, the equestrians were very, very worried about that. So, so that was really good. We got a lot of uh, very good information. And then we had uh, four public open houses, two in Anchorage, one in Girdwood, and one in Eagle River. Uh, we had over 300 people attend all of them. Mostly we had people marking on maps, filling out comment sheets, and we also have the maps up at the Lusac Library. So we hope to try and get a draft plan this fall, and we have quite a large mailing list now, so we'll be letting people know when we have the draft plan and, and just continuing on with that. Uh, we also just had Bike to Work Day, and 
when we have bike to work day, uh, I work with the uh, Department of Health, who runs the, the bike to work teams. And in addition, we, I have volunteer counters out all over town. And this year we had 14 stations. We counted over 4,000 bicyclists going through. And Mr. Lyon and Mr. Morris were both volunteer counters for me. 178 <laughs> There are also a number of uh, feed type stations around town and they coordinate through the bicycle commuters of Anchorage. So we were up 16% from last year for all the bicyclists that we counted. So we're really getting a growing number of, of bicyclists um, coming around. I know that I've handed out the bike map before that we put together. We're updating for 2012 and basically it has a new cover and we moved the construction cones around. And um, last year we gave out over 25,000 of these maps. So I, I'm continuing to use, uh, I just have a, a few months left on the bicycle uh, plan grant through AMAP. So we're using that and we're also going to put together a brochure on changes to Title IX uh, for both motorists and bicyclists so that people are aware of the new laws, things like you, sh you can't ride a bicycle on the sidewalks downtown, things like that. And always, when you're driving, give three foot clearance from bicyclists. So um, that's pretty much what we're working on. Uh, just we're also giving some bicycle safety classes, traffic skills 101, and we're trying to get a league certified instructor course for a number of the Anchorage Police Department people. So. Are there any questions? Oh, there will be, I'm sure. <laughs> let's, let's start with you, Mr. Birch. Do you have some comments or questions? No, I, I uh, did notice the, uh, the good turnout coming off the hillside on the bike to work day. And uh, uh, I think the last time I biked to work, I got the uh, I did get the award for the longest distance. So, All right. Yeah, good, good job. <laughs> it's ramping up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Lori, have you had a chance to aggregate all the statistics from your from your volunteer checkers, your counters? Well, you know, we didn't get too detailed. Um, mostly it's, I do have a 89% uh, were wearing helmets. That was actually one of the other questions, so that's great. Uh, and and we passed that on to the Alaska Injury Prevention Center as well. Well, if you, if you get the numbers in, in, in each of the different stations, in, you know, like Greg's and yours and so on and so forth, and put them on a little table, that would be fun oh, to review. Well, if, you, if you like, I can, well, you got maybe that. we can make copies, or I can make copies and bring them back. Okay, or you can email it to me, that's fine. Okay, yeah. uh, certainly. Um, and when you get the new bike maps, we'll take a few of those too. Okay. <laughs> um, and then I guess the final thing, uh, on the bike to work day, I, I did notice a few people who did literally do bike to work day and got a ride home. Maybe people with the boat up the hill. Just <laughs> 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 one Not bike from work day. Uh, <laughs> and I had a lot of fun. This was my third consecutive year trying to thwart the uh, health effects of bike to work day by handing out bacon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> along the trail. But, uh, who? <laughs> 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 Do you have any comments or questions? For well, although, uh, you know, I heard there was a bacon station and a beer station. That's a... Uh, well, I think they had coupons. Yeah, coupons. Yeah, it was coupons it was for beer at the bacon station. We were, we were doubling up on the health <laughs> negotiation. We, we didn't want to do the inebriated bicyclist thing. <laughs> I will ride for bacon. <laughs> I got a couple questions, Lori. Um, number one. Do you think the, I'm going to beat this drum, but is the uptake due to the increased number of vacant stations or is it actually the health effects? <laughs> oh, I, heard there's more, I heard there was two this year. Were there one or two vacant stations? There's a bunch of feed stations. Yeah, just one there's, station. there's, one. Okay. there's a bunch of uh, feeding stations. Um, CRW had one, USKH had one, um, FedEx had one, Alaska Regional Hospital, of course, nice. BCA with nope. the, 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 the Mr. 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 <laughs> okay. Do you have um, when you say four thousand bikes went on this day? Do, do you have any other days where you count uh, commuter bicycles on the system? I mean, I, I suspect this is you know a hundred times more than the average. You know, there's probably yeah. fifteen or twenty people that biked in there. Whatever. Like, I'm sure there's a huge disproportion. Do we have any baseline stats on how many people bike? year-round or an average basis to work? No, we don't. Um, you know, the national average is 6%. Uh, we've, we've thought about going out like it in the winter, 
uh, because there are a lot of bicyclists now, it's just getting the volunteers. I mean, people are very excited to go out and, and do it for this one day, but I have, right. I have 25 people out there. Right. And we're out from 6.30 to 9. So, you know, it's it, 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 it could be really long on a cold day. It snowed two years ago, and it was, it was a long shift. Yeah, so that, that was a question that was asked in our last regional household travel survey, 2001, mm -hmm. I think is when it was done, 2000, 2001. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's in the TIP amendment right now to do a new one, and that's one of the questions it's asked. So How we take more anecdotal I mean, or, or personal right. statements as opposed to actually counting them, though. Right. As, right. You yeah. know, that's, you know, like a lot of things. Right. How many Someone calories, says they how many calories day, are sugar they eat a day, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. Well, on that note, I mean, at some point, uh, we need to do a, I guess, a cost analysis of how much we're spending per biker. I mean, because we're clearly putting a lot of money into uh, facilities, whether it's, uh, you know, striping, bike lanes, uh, all that sort of stuff. And um, if we're truly trying to serve a commuter population, uh, we need to have better data so we know what we're spending per uh, per biker because I think in, in our decision making that's got to be a key element of, of, of what we decide so I don't know how you're going to collect that data but I'd certainly like to see something more than anecdotal when it comes to spending millions and millions of dollars on uh, bike commuters yeah. and that's that's kind of where I was yeah that, this whole I can thing think of is, you know, well, and, and you know, there there is a cost factor, but there's also a safety factor. I mean, when we are building bicycle lanes, we are creating a safer place for bicyclists to be, and I don't think you can put a dollar value on that. So. No, no, I, I'm not asking for uh, to debate it, just uh, literally, you know, what are we spending on, on specific facilities for bike commuters, and how many do we have? I mean, it's just a, an analysis we need to do is doing our job. Mm -hmm. So let me, and, and what got me thinking about this was that I saw somewhere, and I don't know where it was, but I thought I saw some number that said Anchorage or, or somebody had, you know, we had like a, a pretty high percentage of bike commuters, like, you know, we were number seven nationally or number 13 or something. I, I just thought to myself, that just doesn't make sense to me. I mean, I get it maybe this one day a year, we make that criteria, but it is kind of hard to understand mm -hmm. what the real day-to-day -day use is. You know, we can go out and count cars all we want. And to some extent, I'm not sure, I may disagree with me a little bit on this, but you know, to some extent, I'm not really sure that it has to be a commuter you know, to, to give the, the facility value you know, personally. Mm -hmm. I mean, if people are using it for recreation or using it to go to the grocery store or using right. it to pick up their laundry, you know, whatever they do, that, you know. But I, I do think we need, you know, as, as the mayor said, I think it would be helpful for us to make decisions about when, we're, when we really have a better idea of how many people we're serving. And, and certainly safety, and there's other factors. It isn't just a dollar for dollar equation. You know, we all know that, but it, it is a baseline to help us gauge some of the relevant importance of these things. So I, I don't know if there's an easy answer here, but I guess that's that's something I'm always interested in. Is yeah, the peak day is always interesting, but what about the, you know, the third Wednesday in September? You know, how many people are out there biking to work or using the trail? So the last thing I got for you is. Um, you said you're working on a trail plan. What's the basic timeline for adoption and the process for that? Well, if we have a draft by this fall, uh, we would hope to have something um, next spring to be approved. So to, before this body, probably later this year, and then you know the back and forth process begins. So hopefully a, an approval next spring. So better part of a year then. Yes. Get approved. And, and that's optimistic. I know I said one more, well, one more after that. Um, mm -hmm. So how, how long are the um, bike plan and the pedestrian plan, what, what's their life? Is it a four year, six year? Is it tell, until, a, you know, until I, modified? I'm sorry, I can't remember. I know we wrote in our goals. Where's John Springer? Yeah, I don't remember um, the time frame. <laughs> but there is, there is an actual timeline. Well, the, 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 the trails plan was I think it's done. an update every five years. Five years. Okay, like, right. and, Okay, that's fine. Thanks. That popped in my mind. Okay, Thank thanks. You. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, so next we've got public transportation update. Mr. Wilbur, is that you? Thank you? Give me a minute. Right, this thing up. Yes, ma'am. Were, were there any public comments? Didn't we have public comments on that? We did not, Mr. Chairman. We did not? Yeah, I'm just so rude to the public today. I apologize. <laughs> Does the public want to have a comment or question for Ms. Skanky on her presentation? Okay, thanks for reminding me. I'll try to be better. It's twice today. Mr. Wilbur. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to wait for the. I have a short presentation that I'd like to give just to kind of highlight 
what uh, some of the achievements that we've had in public transportation and how we got there and what to look for in the future um, and why this thing is warming up. Um, it gets fired up. I think the biggest thing that we're looking forward to and, and people over is in two weeks we're going to have a brand new fare collection system on our entire, uh, all of our buses and so I'll be talking a little bit about about that. So. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jennifer. So um, again, I'd just like to kind of highlight what's gone on in public transportation for the last uh, 12 months and then um, uh, kind of how we got there and some of the things that we've been doing and then a little bit about what our future is. But let me start with uh, some of the achievements that we've made. Um, the thing that we look for in public transportation and our performance is really, are we where we're gonna be when we tell people we're gonna be there? What's our on-time performance? It's um, probably the one of three primary measures that I look at in the overall system. And in 2000 and... Can you define on-time? On-time, thank you. On-time for us means if the bus is scheduled to be at a particular location, if it is there within five minutes of the scheduled time, it is considered on-time. Six minutes, it's late. Okay. So in um, 2011, considering from January to December, our, on -time our average on-time performance was 71%, which means that 71% of the time, our buses were at the bus stop where they said they were going to be, that 71% includes the days that we were scheduled to operate and did not due to weather. It, it accounts for construction, it accounts for detours, it accounts for the weather, it accounts for everything. So we did not take that time out and say we had an obstacle and our time performance was down. We averaged all that in so we were 71% on time in 2000. And 11. Our anchor rides was 93% on time. Their window is if you are there within the 15 minutes of a scheduled delivery or pickup, you are on time. We had a lot of um, we had a lot of challenges uh, in the winter time. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, ask a question before we leave this topic. Sure, I think that's fine. Um, Lance, on the on the uh, you said you. For example, you, that includes when you weren't running because of weather. How many days were you unable to operate? I think we had um, the days, I think we had three, and they were the, the same days that the district wasn't running. For example, if the district shut down, we shut down. If they started late, we would start late. And when we decide that, we, uh, we work with street maintenance, this, both at the city, the state, the district, and us. I mean, if it looks like the weather's gonna be inclement, we basically get up at three or four o'clock in the morning and go everywhere and look at the routes and see if we can make it or not. And we make a decision by 4 a.m. to whether or not we're going to start our system at 5 a.m. Okay. And, and, and is it always the same decision the school district makes, or do you sometimes? No, decide? sometimes they will decide to um, close early or leave, and we won't do that. But typically, we always agree on whether or not if we're just going to shut the service down just due to the weather, just due to driving conditions, because okay. so we're pretty much in the same. Closure thing. is concurrent, but. Schedule changes, maybe not. That's correct. And, and you said you also that that included detours and construction. When you have a major project, uh, construction project, do you not change your timetable? We do not. Really? We do not. Because we would have to reprint. We will notify people of a particular, if they're on a particular route, right. we will notify them that um, due to construction, we may be running five minutes. And when we do construction, we work with both the city and the state. We will put in a temporary bus stop. So sometimes that takes a little bit of a Bit of a change. It's not a significant amount, but for example, 36th Avenue, it was tore up for almost the entire summer in 2011. And we have a lot of runs that go from Midtown to the University, and every run on 36th Avenue was running behind because of the construction. Thank so, you, Mr. Chairman. Sure. It makes a big difference. Um, the other thing that we would, I'd like to point out to the committee is kind of our ridership. Our ridership from 2010 to 11 is going, has gone up. Um, it's about uh, three and a half percent. Um, when we're looking at ridership, we're looking at our van pools, our anchor rides, and our buses, and all three categories were increased. Um, our van pool program, even though the bars aren't uh, shown a lot, but we had a significant increase in our van pool program. But right now, we are um, over 15,000 people a day on our system as of uh, now. Our over-counter sales, which are pretty much at the transit center downtown, they're up over 30%, and our advertising revenues are up. Um, 
we have a lot of people that want to advertise on the bus. We don't, do, you know, we um, we don't have a lot of blank space inside and outside the bus, and um, so that's good news for us because we look at it as a revenue stream. Some of the other things I want to point out that we've made um, some bus stop improvements. We'll continue to uh, make changes at our bus stops, not only at our hubs, but some of our key locations. The one on the bottom left there happens to be a new um, on-time message board that we've got located uh, at strategic location, location. This one we have them at the university, downstairs uh, in the at Diamond and across the street. And really this, this shows uh, the on, when the bus is going to be there and the time it, that it's scheduled. So that's uh, new, new information that we give to our passengers. It's basically the same thing you would see at an airport. Um, some of the uh, information changes that were shown in the bottom center has to do with the collections that are coming in online payments and how we're managing that and then our fleet we had uh, eight new buses come in at the beginning of the year these are basically uh, clean continue to be uh, clean burning diesel fuel you notice the new buses actually at the top they have a heater that um, all of the ventilations at the top and not in the back it, um, and then the inside of the buses are, are pretty much the same some of the things that we've done to get to where, well, uh, the things that we've accomplished, we've had a lot of changeover inside the public transportation department um, from my position at the director, the superintendent, the foreman, had a lot of drivers, got a lot of new drivers in. I would say probably 20% of our drivers are new in the last 18 months, um, just due to retirements and attrition. Um, and I think the crew as a whole has got a, a unique perspective and different. They, I mean, they're really looking at us not as a transportation business, but um, you know, our presence isn't that we're getting people from point A to point B safely. It's uh, what's our customer service like? How are we treating them? And, they, and, and how has that trip felt to them? Obviously, we're always mindful of our budget, uh, making sure that the things that we're doing and the time that we're spending doing it. When, when I look at a route, uh, it's a difficult decision that uh, the decisions are made based on the amount of passengers we're picking up based on the hours of service that we have on the street. We do have some service where uh, we pick up people from a long distance away and the bus is empty going one way or the other. In other locations, it's, uh, we have people that are standing up on the bus. And so balancing those needs is, is always a challenge for us. But these four items on the bottom here are communication. Uh, how do we communicate to our customers? How do we communicate in the department? What are we doing in the succession planning? You know, there was a lot of lessons learned with some changeover. We had almost 100 years of um, uh, people worked in the department have, have retired. They had over 30 years of experience, and that's nothing new to our department as opposed to others. Really looking at what we can do to increase our choice riders, and not the people that are required to ride the bus, but those that might look to ride the bus one day a week or um, you know, maybe two days a week. And then how are we treating our customers and what's a, what is our image? Um, what is it that we're doing to improve that? So a couple of key points here on our site enhancement crew. We have a site enhancement crew that works pretty much uh, in the afternoons in the wintertime. And this last winter, they really worked hard. Uh, this bottom center picture is a picture of them using saws and chisels to cut out a, a foot of ice in front of a bus stop. When you step out of the shelter, you had to step up a foot to get to there so you could get to the street. And these guys here just, I mean, they just did an amazing amount of work just, and it's all done with hands. And um, just a, they just deserve a lot. The top left is uh, what the bench looked like. The, the one on the right is what it, what it comes out to be. So the other things that we've done is we put in, um, we continue to put in some cameras and safety measures. We have cameras in the center. We have a list of about 12 bus stops that are causing us concerns where people either, they, um, they have some concerns about whether or not they're waiting. And so at Muldoon, at Benny Benson, and at Mountain View, we've installed cameras at the bus stops and we can watch those and we've been working with APD. So if we have some continued incidences, we've been working with them. We also have uh, undercover units on our buses in a couple of our routes and they've been very helpful. And I think that's a, it's a very good thing. Face so, plans. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you guys have some sort of uh, formal or semi-formal reporting system for your employees to get data to the APD? Yes, yes. 
Um, they are, they are, if they run into an incident on a bus, um, the first thing they're required to do is get to dispatch, our dispatch. Mm -hmm. And then our dispatch will make a judgment as to whether or not to call APD. Our drivers do not call APD, our dispatch does. And it, it's a, you know, obviously if you have someone on the, on the bus that's causing a ruckus or making it unsafe for the driver or passengers, and APD has been very responsive to that. If they're at a, if they're at a bus stop, um, you know, the response is, it's probably not as rapid as it is when we have them on the bus. I guess I was speaking a little more broadly in terms of, you know, behavior they might see in the neighborhood that, that is um, useful. For example, uh, one of your drivers informed one of the folks in my neighborhood about some folks uh, using the bus to access a, shall we say, laxly enforced package store outlet. <laughs> right. uh, and we used that information to to get the the uh, some of the CAP, the CAP team engaged and they were able to catch some misbehavior in action based on that data. Our drivers do know that they particularly at bus stops, if they see some activity going on at bus stops that would make our passengers feel uncomfortable, they will let our dispatch know so yes, they do, but as they're driving around in general, they don't, but at our bus locations, they do. So it just might be something, you know, form that they have that they can fill out at the end of their shift. Hey, I noticed this at this time, and, and okay. it's, not a, it's not an instant thing. It's just one of those data points that our, our law enforcement folks can yeah, use. Our drivers do see a lot, I mean, and uh, they let us know. <laughs> So I think the last thing I just want to talk about is the new fare collection system that we're going to have in place uh, starting June 11th. And right now, um, our fare collection system is pretty limited to our drivers ripping off a tab and giving to a passenger if they want a day pass, uh, a monthly pass, uh, works on a calendar day, coins coming in, different types of denominations. This new system, we're we're making a, a lot of changes, and I put a, a little flyer that we've been passed that we passed out passed out to you um, regarding the fare. Uh, let me just point to a couple things. There's a couple key things that I want to point out, uh, and not in any particular order. But right now, people uh, we will still have a daily ride, a daily um, a ticket ride, and the other thing we're going to allow folks to do is buy a 20 ride ticket. What that means is you can buy the ticket and use it any 20 rides that you want, in and out. So if you're coming into town and you're a tourist and you're here for a week and you want to ride the bus, you can use it. And then when you come back, you can use it again. It does not expire, so it continues on. And it's different for, um, and it's a different fare whether you're paying the adult fare, a youth fare, or a, um, a senior fare. The other thing we're going to be doing is uh, right now our monthly passes, they are on a calendar month. So if you buy them on the 10th, they're only good till the 30th. We're going to replace those with a 30-day pass. They're effective 30 days from the day you just trigger it to the end. So a lot of other benefits we're going to see from this as far as our cash management. And um, it's going to make it a lot easier for the drivers. We have smart cards that we're working with the UAA. To, they will just swipe in. They're really the only ones that we're working with right now on a smart card. You can use a um, or on a uh, yeah on a swipe card, but we're allowed to load smart cards in a variety of different ways. So we're really looking forward to this. We've been doing a lot of outreach. We've been to the senior center, VA, community councils, Diamond Center, malls, everywhere, just kind of doing a display on this. And we've got a press conference with the mayor next Wednesday to um, uh, kind of the week before we go, and just to show how this thing is working. So. Really looking forward to this one. I think it's going to make it a, a lot smoother for the customers. They get on, they'll know if they put the right number in. Drivers don't have to debate it. If they don't have the right money in, they don't ride. And um, I think it's going to be a, a lot better system. So we've been working on this one for quite some time. So with that, um, I don't have anything else. We've got a lot going on at, at People Mover. Um, so I look forward to any comments or questions you might have. Let me um, let me get the public first since I've obviously got some kind of problem today. So, does anybody from the public have any questions, comments, concerns they'd like to express? Skanky. I, I wish you'd put a, a bike on the front of your bus. You oh, would. Because <laughs> <laughs> that is one thing that I, I think a lot of people use. So, I think it's great. Thank you. You asked for it. <laughs> <laughs> Next one. 
That's a good idea, Lori. Yeah, okay, let's, yeah. let's go to the committee. Mr. Mayor, you've got a few things. I just want to, and slightly off topic, but uh, um, it came to my attention that uh, the Transit Center, uh, ACDA, has a new security contract, and uh, the Transit Center is closing earlier than before, and that might be causing you some um, some problems. Uh, is that getting resolved? Uh, I just heard about it yesterday. So, uh, um, I'm, Yes, it's true that uh, they're changing the hours right now. Um, they're changing their security contract, and we have security and the doors are open until 11 o'clock at night effective June 1 based on their the current situation they would be closing at 9 30 so we would be able to get into the building and there would be no security I've contacted ACDA and I've asked them two particular things one um, might there be some access for or changing the hours because many a times our, our need for the security and having the doors open is in the evening more so than early in the morning so mr. mayor we're working with them to do that um, I haven't had a response with them on whether or not they'd be acceptable. Ideally, and as we've done in the past, uh, when we expand or shrink our hours, they expand or shrink their security and access to the building. As the mayor knows and many do, we are basically tenants in the building. We pay rent, lease, we pay for the security. Um, frankly, I'm not really happy with it, but we're trying to work something out that is beneficial to us and beneficial to the customer. So, um, we're still working on it. Okay. Well, the mayor and I know some people who are on the board of ACDA. <laughs> We'd be happy to advise them if you'd like. <laughs> I, I could just follow on. You know, no. are you on, Chris, with Ernie? Or I think I'm the alternate. Or the alternate. Okay. And I, I told Larry Baker I, because he's on the board from the yeah. administration. Um, yeah, that's not acceptable. So I, there's three major issues, Mayor. One is, um, you know, basically our passengers won't be able to wait indoors after in inclement weather, maybe in daylight today after 9.30 at night. We have a lot of restaurants, businesses, um, establishments that close after 9 o'clock and they take buses <coughs> between 9 and 11 and they'll have to wait outside. They can still catch the bus. That's one. The second one is we won't have any security in case the passenger or our drivers need some assistance. We don't need it all the time, but when we do, it's very appreciated. That's probably the second item. And the third thing is, is that, that since that bus, that location is a hub for our um, our entire system it's a it's a location and a time for our drivers either take a break take a lunch and that is the location so they use the facilities to wait inside um, maybe use the facilities while they can and they won't be afforded either one of those opportunities now so it, it's it's not good for our drivers no just so you know like it just came to my attention we're on it and we're gonna try and help any way we can thank you Mr. Birch, any further it's comments? Totally separate no, I, I think it's uh, you know great for the and, and uh, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm kind of intrigued by your that. your new uh, your fare uh, box. That's, that's great. Thank you, Mr. Flynn. Well, you know, so we give us parking authority enforcement to and can take it away if we have to. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay. So I like it. Comments, or questions. I had a couple things, Lance. Um, you, you had some statistics up there, and I guess you know most of them were a couple of year statistics. How's your ridership compared to what it was 20 years ago, or 15 years ago, or 10 years ago? Um, I'd have to look back. Memory serves me. Um, in the last 10 years, uh, 2008 was a spike for us, and that is a, when fuel was pretty close to where it is right now. And when it spiked, it didn't go down at the same proportion that fuel went down. It stayed pretty flat. Um, I can purport that we, we keep the numbers back to 1982. But I mean, are you higher than you were? Yes, we're climbing. Yeah. Okay. We're, I think this is the highest we've ever been. Good. <coughs> um, what about, uh, do you do a bus to work day? <laughs> Every we day. don't do a bus to work day. Every day is bus well, to I'm work just day. Thinking, you know, you Bacon station. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I got a lot to learn, I guess, from the bike folks. The bike point. people seem to be yeah. kind of a step ahead of you here. Yeah, I think <laughs> you're right. I have a lot to learn. I, I guess, you know, just a, a thought. You know, yep. bus to work, it could work for you. You know, get people on the bus. A lot of times, once people try something, they find out how to use the, the pass card or whatever. They're more willing to try it the second time than the first. So well, they, they just push like the kids free on Tuesday or something like that mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Yeah, we let um, we let seniors ride free on Wednesdays and we let kids ride free on Thursdays during the summertime. How do you define senior? <laughs> You're not. <laughs> not <laughs> not <here>. you. <laughs> Once again, I'm in that unprotected class of people. Um, <laughs> well, I've been to Okay, sir, go ahead, Mr. Bridge. 
uh, I'm trying to remember what, what's the unit that that, that turns the light the the on traffic si yeah the traffic signal green. How does it? Is that keeps it green longer or it keeps it green? Yeah. Those uh, don't believe the buses have those, do they? Yeah, they, they, they do. do. Yeah, they do. there's kind of a flap over whether they are going to impact anything. I have. I, I'm assuming they are working fine because I have it on the one route. We still put on one, two. Routes. Okay, yeah. yeah. It's happening now. And not every intersection either. It's only right. some of the things over by Diamond, uh, when it, or off, right. off the Diamond. Well, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. so what's the, get, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious. Just a five seconds or 15 seconds. So um, yeah. I'm talking with the municipal traffic engineer, and um, I've agreed that uh, we are not going to put any more Opticom in because I know the state and the city are working on new signal controllers. Until the sig new signal controllers get implemented, we would then implement more Opticom on those routes. Our, our bus fleet, or pretty much our entire bus fleet, does have the device because not one bus runs that route, mm -hmm. so it may get mixed up. But um, I think there's some benefits to, there'll be benefits to us as people mover with the new signal controllers and then figuring out what routes we actually need it. Which actually, what routes we actually are we behind due to congestion during a particular type of the day? So we would only run it on all route, on some of the routes. So we, we are plan to do more of it. We're not doing more of it right now until those controllers. So again, back to kind of a theme that we've had here earlier. Do you have a, a method for measuring yes. how much your service is improved or how much you're saving time idling or what is your metric on that for success? It's on time performance and whether or not they're um, getting from the time they start to the time they end. As a matter of fact, when we asked the assembly to, to uh, allow us to continue using this tool, we provided them with a briefing pair with that measure. And so you so, have a measurable yes. improvement yes. using that system? Yes. We kind of forced them to do that when we initially offered them the authority. It's, it was reasonable. Uh, yeah. We gave them a one-year sunset to come back and report. All right. Any? I think we've had about enough of this. Have we? Anybody else in the last parting shot? Okay, good. Um, thanks, Mr. Wilbur, for your presentation. Thank you. Informative and somewhat positive. He did. Not he always the so oh, That's right. Policy committee. So we've got a couple more meetings coming up. Uh, TAC and policy committee in June are listed here, and in July. Mr. Ryan, is your sense do we have any heavy lifting to do in the next couple months? I, I know some people start, like myself, thinking about traveling a little bit sometimes in the summer. Do we have any major we have uh, our, action uh, items before us in the next couple months, just out of curiosity? The major member number three of the TIP will be heard at the assembly on June 5th, I believe. Or, yeah, the 5th. And so those two June meetings are when the TAC and the policy committee will hopefully finalize that amendment. Okay. After that, not so much. Not so much. Yeah, you know, a little, little, little smooth sailing for a bit. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks. Anything else? Any any committee comments, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, I, I don't know if anybody's met our new port director, oh. Rich Wilson. He's joined us today. And uh, uh, if you haven't met Rich or have any concerns about the port, this is your guy. And uh, thank you for taking on the, the challenge, sir. Oh, my pleasure, Rich. Let's see. You. All right. Any other announcements for the good body? Um, Mr. Chairman, I just. Okay. Really want to say thank you to the mayor to for highlighting the people who were uh, at your press conference during next week, um, and, and it might, as a, as a suggestion, be a good idea to do something similar with the trails update, get more more information out there for people yeah. engaged. Absolutely. But thank, thank you for doing that. Nope. Does anybody have any objection to adjourning this meeting? Or adjourn. Yeah. Okay.